Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Joseph Geraci, and I'm the CEO of Nechimer Corp. Uh, I'm also uh, an assistant professor at Queen's University. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about um, how we've been able to mix quantum and classical machine learning for the classification of lung cancer. Uh, and I'm going to jump into some other topics when it comes to how quantum is starting to uh, allow for advancements into the medical sciences and how I envision this uh, happening. And I'll show you some, some cool interactive AI as well. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's continue and move forward. So, um, so what, what is disease mathematically? I mean, and, and you know, to me, after, after doing this work for quite a while, mixing mathematics and medicine, uh, disease is essentially a, a network problem, right? So we have brain uh, networks because of the way our brain is connected uh, to each other through its individual neurons. And, we, and as a molecular machine, our wiring is essentially these networks, which are, you know, we use networks to model these protein interactions, which is essentially our, our molecular wiring, our molecular machinery. And so what I did is I dedicated many years to understanding how this molecular machinery can be modeled, how these, these networks in our brains and, 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 and our protein interactions, genetic interactions and so forth, how they can be modeled. So it's basically, we're basically a big graph theory problem. Um, and, and so evolution knows this, right? Because viruses attack hubs. Um, bacteria attack immune nodes, right? And our immune system can wreak havoc within our brain networks and can even change the way our brains are connected, right? So this, I hope, convinces you that we are this molecular machine. Now there's this new layer coming about with our microbiome, our, our, you know, the, our poop, right? The bacteria in our guts. These things uh, actually have a massive systemic world. They send us signals which affect the different networks in our body and are responsible for a lot of our health. And so a lot of the work that we do at Metromark revolves around understanding networks and integrating all these different types of data. So essentially we are complex electrical chemical networks. And so therefore diseases are related to each other. And so one of the things we do in our company is we're starting to understand from a graph theory perspective, how different diseases literally relate to each other. And so what a doctor may have called Alzheimer's uh, or calls Alzheimer's now, in a few years, we're gonna have different names for these things. There's different etiologies, different mechanisms at play that it looks like, you know, when someone has Alzheimer's or has dementia, it looks like the same thing as someone else's dementia, but really it was a different set of machinery that, that caused it to go, a different set of problems that initiated this. this uh, problem. So graphs, right? And quantum computation is going to be very important for this, but we'll get there. So I'm going to talk about something we actually did on a quantum computer. So an example here is gene expression. So gene expression is basically this, it's, you know, you have DNA and it gets transcribed to RNA and then translated into these amino acid chains. And then the amino acid chains fold and you get yourself a protein, which is a three-dimensional structure. Right, so the gene expression basically counts the genes in the DNA that end up getting turned into RNA. And this, this is this transcription, and that's what we count. And so what we did is we utilized transcription data from 104 lung cancer patients, um, two different types of non-small cell lung cancer, we'll get into it. Um, but we wanted to get the D-Wave machine to help us build a predictive model on how we can predict if someone had the different subtype of non-small cell lung cancer, as this will alter treatment. And it makes a great proof of principle for you know, what may be possible in the future with these machines. Now, remember I told you that the, our body is essentially a graph, a disease attacks you know, different nodes in our, in our graph and so forth. This representation you see on the bottom, this network, is essentially 
uh, a graph that represents cancer, certain types of cancer. Uh, and, and these networks, if you explore them correctly, can, can actually lead us to understanding disease better. Okay, so let's talk about D-Wave and restricted Boltzmann machine. So here's a bit of math, okay? So when you have a restricted Boltzmann machine, restricted Boltzmann machine is a type of neural network. It, it has a, uh, a set of input layers, right? And, and then these hidden layers. And it's essentially these are generative models. They learn the distribution of what you teach them. And then you can turn the crank and they will generate examples. And we can use these for classifications and I'll explain that. So these neural networks, they can be stacked together to create deep belief nets. Uh, and yeah, Hinton uh, is known for doing this. So listen, this thing is, is the way we, this has been inspired from statistical physics. So this, this object, this little creature you see with the, the four V nodes and the three you know, hidden H nodes, um, this, this equation here tells you about the energy of that system. And the energy of that system is dependent on, on, on these, um, these probabilities. And so essentially, essentially what we realized is that if you can learn the parameters, this, this B, B prime, C prime, and, and W, if you can learn these things, these parameters, you can basically generate all the data you want. And those are the parameters that have to do with what, what you want the machine to learn. In our case, we wanted to learn about these 104 lung cancer patients. So what this means is that we wanted to, we wanted to get the maximum of this function here. And when you work it out, when you do the math, this, this um, gradient, it's actually three. So theta is actually B, C, and, and W, these parameters. So what, and if you want to solve this equation, it's really a problem, right? So again, so to reiterate, if we can know these B, C, and W parameters, which are the biases and weights in that, where we have our model, right? The problem is the second part of this gradient equation that you see here depends on a massive combinatorial, like this, of, you know, this explosion of combinations of V's and H's. And um, what statistical phys physicists will say is that it involves the computation of the partition function, which is very hard. Let me tell you, I wrote some papers on that. So what you do here though, is you, you, this idea was that you encode this problem onto um, the, the D-wave chimera graph. And so what that means, is that you can actually turn the D-Wave machine into, uh, into, into something that you can sample from the Boltzmann distribution. And if you do it just right, you can actually sample and, and, and there's this very cool method, the, the, the link on the bottom, if you have enough time to write that down, it will, it will explain how you can actually uh, go about and do this. So it's very cool. So you can actually use the D-Wave machine to, um, to get this to cook and to sample from this distribution. So now what we did is we reduced the number of genes via several methods. I'm gonna show you one of them. I'm gonna show you some classical machine learning that's interactive and allows you to uh, actually see um, how patients relate to each other. And we'll, we'll get to that. So what we did is we reduced the number of genes and then there were 54 adenocarcinoma and 50 squamous carcinoma uh, patients or samples. We reduced it down to these three genes. And then what we did was clamping. And here on the right is an example of what we mean by clamping. Here was just an example we put in our paper about telling between male and females. But in this case, we want to do a clamp for adeno versus squamous. So what you do is you add these extra two nodes and you train the machine so that the machine will have a one zero for adenocarcinoma and a zero one for squamous. So once, so once it learns about the distribution, you can put in a new sample and it will output uh, a representation of that person and the clamp will tell you what kind of uh, cancer they have. And we did this and it performed beautifully on the D-Wave machine, 95.24% with a, a cross-validation. Okay, so what I wanna do now is I wanna actually show you a demo 
of, of how we interact with this data in Netramark, how we actually drive this through. So let me see if I can do that. So, uh, and right now what we're doing is we're, this technology is being used right now in academic institutions and biotech companies, pharmaceutical. So let me get this video started here. Okay, so, um, so what we have here is basically, it's an AI platform that allows us to dive in to patient populations. And this is what we utilized in order to reduce and understand what was going on and create a data set so that we can move forward and use other techniques, other machine learning techniques, because the AI here is quite different. This is meant to allow you to explore and dive into uh, these patient populations. The machine generates hypotheses, as you're about to see. So what you see here is this system has different apps. This is, a, this is an interactive app that we call NetroPlay. The machine learns about the patient population and then allows you to dig in. On the left here, these are the variables that are reduced from. It started with all 20,000 genes. It reduced down to, to, uh, 20, uh, to 16. And what's amazing is the accuracy behind this, right? So a big problem people always say, how do you not overfit? Well, there's some awesome mathematics here that's quite different from other machine learning methods. But what this allows us to do is actually understand how you can take these complex you know, data sets, hone in, understand what's going on, interact with it. For example, here, what the user is doing is it's circling these, these squamous cell carcinoma patients and saying, oh, look, this is the main variable on the left that you see is driving this. And so let's ask Google what it is. So let's see uh, what Google says that this gene is. So the gene is IRF6. So Google says this is about non-small cell lung cancer, adeno versus squamous. So beautiful, it's amazing. And, and so what you can do here is you can compare the adenocarcinoma with the squamous. If you circle two groups, it actually does a statistic for you. If you circle one, it kind of tells you what genes are involved in binding it together. And here you can see, and it does these significant values and does statistics. This is all great, but it, you know, what you can do is you can zoom in and understand even within the disease, there's subtypes. Now, this is the fascinating thing. So there's different perspectives that the machine uh, captures. These different, these different perspectives are very important to, to, uh, to allow a user, a biologist or a doctor to dive in and understand. Here's an example. We, had, we, had, we just asked the machine to learn the difference between squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma. But here what the machine did is it separated, without us asking, it separated the adenocarcinoma group into two groups in an unsupervised way. It just did it. And, and now what we, the user did is asked it why. So if you look at this gene and you look it up, this is amazing. The significance was the p-value was 10 to the negative eight when it did the statistics of, you know, you have to ask it, why did you do this? And it's this SLC6A8. And yes, it's been implicated according to Google has, we're in the right disease, non-small cell cancer, you know, you know non-small cell lung cancer. But the amazing thing here is that this gene has been implicated in differing aggressiveness. So what it actually found without us asking is groups of patients that differ in terms of their aggressiveness profile of this adenocarcinoma of the lung. And so that's, this has allowed us to penetrate various um, diseases. We've worked in psychiatry, you know, uh, cancers and, and neurodegeneration. So what this means, what this means for us is that we have a way to, to it allows us to dive into the disease and it allows us to really hone in on what's going on in the subpopulations. And then what it does is it allows us to complement this with quantum computation. It allows us to, to, you know, in the future, we'll be able to build these beautiful models. Now, one of the things I wanted to get to and I started off with was talking about molecular machinery. And because, and the reason I bring this up is because if you look at disease, you actually, it's not just about the protein interactions, but there's all kinds of different factors that go into the disease. There's, and, you know, for example, you can see a few things happening here, right? There's DNA repair components that have to do with the disease. There's mitochondrial components uh, and, you know, metabolic and so forth. So, you know, is there a way, and like we do this in Netramark now, we actually explore these complex networks. And so what we do now is we use these classical methods to understand what, where should we drug? Where, how do you find the Achilles heel behind the disease? So we use these, these centrality measures, for example. Some of them are complex. 
the ones I'm about to show you here are, are known ones. For example, you know, how long would it take for a node to send information to the rest of the network by passing a signal to one node at a time? And so this, this measure called closest centrality you know, tells you that. Right now, here in this example, there's between the centrality. So these are different ways of understanding complex networks. So what we do here is we, um, the between the centrality actually tells you, are there any nodes which are important in terms of building, in terms of connecting hubs? And that's between the centrality. Um, are you connected to very connected people? Google used to be based on this eigenvector centrality. And now the idea is, of course, random walks, right? Random walks gives you a way to reconnoiter these complex spaces. And it allows you to extract this important information. But we've learned that actually quantum random walks can be superior on certain networks over others. And and understanding which ones is difficult, right? And D-Wave has this ability to do these continuous walks. And, you know, what we're starting to explore is, is there a way to speed up ways of understanding these complex networks and, and in order to be able to find the Achilles heel of disease? And so I'm not going to go through this, but essentially there's discrete time quantum walks and continuous time quantum walks. Right, one you do on the circuit model, the other one, the continuous, you can do on the D wave machine by putting it into this Hamiltonian formulation. And what we're learning is that as the architectures improve, we're going to be able to uh, establish that we can do these, these, uh, you know, we can explore these disease networks much more powerfully. Right, I'm not going to get into here, but this is the circuit that actually uh, does this. You know, currently we have quantum walks on one dimensional graphs. We can expand these to arbitrary graphs with a few tricks, and the new architecture is going to allow us to do this. Some of the power that's coming from this is incredible. I'll show you what we've been able to do with the technology I've been showing you. We actually can get machine intelligence to learn about how to drug these different diseases. Here's an example of something that we did for industry that's actually turned into value. And um, what we did here is this. We actually took a super ager data set. So these are individuals that have no cognitive deficits as they age. And we compared them to normal agers. And the machine, by looking at these networks and doing a bunch of AI on these things, has allowed us to, has been able to teach us about these different drugs. I never knew about our Tenamo and Veronistat being used in this way. What's amazing is that Lonafarnib that the machine pulled out is actually in trials for Alzheimer's. And so you can see the power behind this. It's actually allowing us to, to go in and really understand what's going on with the disease and bring up precision medicine. And so, um, and these are some results that we have, but I'm not gonna get into it, but you can see how the networks drive these type of discoveries. So to summarize what we're doing is this. We, we have a hope that quantum computation is gonna allow us to speed up um, how we, how we, um, how we actually can understand precision medicine in, in, a, in a more complete way. And what we can do here is by utilizing, um, um, is by utilizing quantum mechanics, quantum computation, and standard machine learning, we can actually hone in and drive down and understand what's, what's happening. But there's gonna be a lot of work that has to be done on the hardware side before we can make this uh, a reality, you know, this, this bridge between quantum and classical. But it's started. It's starting to happen, and we're excited to explore. Thank you for listening, uh, Dr. Joseph Duratri and Nechimar Corp. Uh, and uh, look us up on the web. Thank you and best wishes.